Okay, so this is uh, this is going to be a video demonstration of the prototype for a 4-bit linear PCM synthesizer that I've designed and built using no microcontrollers, but instead a whole lot of 7400, 74LS series chips, but you may notice they are not quite, or a lot of them are not quite 7400 or 74LS series chips. They are in fact Soviet made clones. So if you're not aware, there were quite a lot of clones of Western components made in the Soviet Union because of course they could not import these components from other sources so they had to make their own and instead of making their own designs they decided to clone it in a lot of cases so for example uh, let's see yeah this this is a K155 LA3 if you transpose it to the English alphabet and the K155 indicates that it's equivalent to a 7400 series chip and the LA3 corresponds to uh, 7400 so this would be four dual input uh, NAND gates in this chip now the KM155 series is just simply in ceramic packages. In fact any of the series with an M after the K indicates that it's a ceramic package. Now you have the KM and you also have or sorry, you have the K K whatever 155. There's also the K555, which actually I don't think I've used any I don't think I've used any of those in here. Although I could have. Um, and those correspond to the 74 LS series. And there's also a few, a, a lot of chips that, of course, are not 7400 series clones. Like this here is a clone of the first op amp ever offered to the general public. Or, let me think, Mu A. 7701? UA701, I think. I'll correct that if it's wrong. Um, but of course it doesn't have the same pinout. So this is actually the only chip on the board that there is no uh, so-called Western equivalent for. And this is just for the uh, output, the output buffer. So let's start, let's just explain a bit of what is going on in the circuit and then we'll try it out. So this this section that's shown in the camera here this is the frequency doubler circuit and uh, this is based on a circuit um, that I found on a website which perhaps I'll put in the description and uh, it's based on three uh, NPN transistors and I'm using these large capacitors because this is all I had with the correct values, but you see these are both one microfarad. So eventually, I'll be using all small uh, rectangular components like that. Um, this is a comparator. This generates. This actually has kind of two functions almost, or three, depending on how you look at it. One is as an internal oscillator. See, here's the control for the frequency of the internal oscillator. And the other is as uh, as a thing for generating nice TTL compatible clock signals from both the regular input here, which is not connected to anything, as well as the frequency doubled input. And I'm using this wire which has something written on it here. It says clock cell. So it's, yeah. Um, 
and that's for of course selecting which clock you want to control the unit. Now this is part of what makes this kind of unique um, is that it it you're you're using an external audio input to actually clock the unit in essence setting the sample rate of playback now there's no actual recording feature aside from programming it um, but I'll get to that later so okay there's the comparator this is just some NAND gates for various things including for blocking out the clock signal if it's in programming mode now this wire here this is for enabling programming mode and, uh, and the one here is for selecting between the ROM and the RAM now it has 256 four bit numbers in each memory chip so there are two memory chips there's the ROM and the RAM so this is the RAM this is just a 2112 RAM chip so 256 by 4 and this is also 256 by 4 this is the ROM and in this case this is this is a clone of a 7400 series uh, PROM PROM chip that has actually been programmed already and it's programmed with some kind of characters like it's 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 a character set of course I've only been able to find web pages in Russian describing what is exactly going on but in any case it takes an 8-bit address as an input and gives a 4-bit 4-bit numbers as its output so <laughs> it's good enough as a ROM for now um, okay continuing these two chips if you notice they're both IE5 in the K155 except this one is ceramic package so they're both um, clones of the 7493 counter chips so basically this will count through from 0 to 255 or uh, using some logic in this chip and in this this chip um, it'll reset when it when uh, when the number zero appears on the data data bus. So uh, so in fact, this wire is for enabling or disabling the reset. So you can pull it out, and that'll disable resetting when it reads zero, or put it in. And this is this one if you touch it like that it'll reset the count um, no matter what so okay so those are the counters this is logic these the, the uh, IM3 and the 74 LS283 now the IM3 is a clone of the 7483 um, which has basically the same function as the 74 283 or LS 283 except a different pinout. Of course I could have used two of the same chips here but I wanted to use as many of these Soviet chips as possible. Which by the way there's quite a few of them as you can see. Lots of Soviet chips purchased on eBay. Pretty cheap. They work nice. Back to this uh, 74 LS 157s. There's two of them, and those. Oh, I should mention. I should mention something. Uh, these these are uh, four-bit adders. So, basically, what this what these adders are for is for allowing an address offset. So when the when the unit is running. If you enter, see this is this I'm using for entering the address. The address is eight bits. And see if I enter anything other than zero, then that'll actually be added to the count. 
So you can start the count at wherever you want using these adders and the uh, excuse me the address chips uh, <laughs> switches. Um, so that's what that's for, and then these 274 LS157s are multiplexers, and so you have kind of two four-bit inputs going to one four-bit output, and one is from the adder chips, so in other words, you know, feeding through the program counter through the adders to the multiplexers, and the other is from the switches. So this is used when it's in programming mode, it'll go to the switches, so that the switches directly control which uh, which address is being accessed. And then of course there's the memory chips which I mentioned. This is the RAM. That is the ROM. Now the ROM RAM switch it, it always has to be set to RAM if you want to program the RAM but if it's set to ROM and it goes into programming mode it will simply select none, neither of the chips because I purposely am trying not to allow the ROM to be selected during programming mode because that would have uh, two or well it, there wouldn't be any point to it at the very least uh, this is the write wire. This allows you to write whatever's on the uh, data switches, which in this case I'm only using these four of them. Write whatever's on the data switches to whatever the selected address in RAM is. And that's what that's for. That'll of course be a button on the finished product. Now this uh, K155LN6 right here, that's, uh, yep, LN6 um, this is a buffer, tri-state buffer for the data switches and it only allows the signal or, you know, the information from the data switches to go onto the data bus when the right switch is pressed the right button is pressed, or in this case, the wire. You go like that. So that's that's how that works. Uh, this 74. Okay, well, K155 TM7. This is just a latch, and actually, this isn't necessarily required. It it kind of could, I mean the design could probably do without it, but what what its purpose is is just to act as kind of a buffer for the DAC output. So this takes the signals all four data bus lines and acts as a buffer and uh, and then here we have the resistors which constitute the uh, digital to analog converter and then that signal goes over here to this amplifier this op amp so that it has sufficiently low output impedance so that it can actually drive your average audio input so uh, yeah and then there's just these which are so this is just acting as a buffer for those LEDs so that we can display the data bus and the address bus. So, why don't we go ahead and turn it on? Now of course nothing's happening because we don't have any uh, clock selected that is actually doing anything. Now what we're going to do, first of all, is we're going to select the internal clock. Now the internal clock's kind of, it's not really that useful, in all honesty. It, uh, yeah, it's, it really isn't. 
So, in any case, it's it is use. I mean, it's it's only really useful for testing, which is what we're doing now. So how how about that? Now here's what's happening right now. This is, by the way, being read uh, after the op amp uh, at uh, this point on the decoupling capacitor. Now, this, of course, is what's in the RAM when you start it up. If you notice, only two of the LEDs are actually doing anything on the data bus. Only three of the LEDs are doing anything on the data bus here because it reads a zero and then loops back to the beginning of this. So we're getting kind of a nice pulse wave. Now, if we turn on an amplifier, That's what we're getting right now. So not, not super exciting. Now, what if we disable looping? So that's what we're getting now. Now this is just what happens to be in the RAM when you start it up. And this is going through the entire 256 4-bit numbers and feeding those to the output. Now of course we can start this, we can offset. And it doesn't really matter in this case because we're not looping. Or, or excuse me, we're not we're not getting to a loop point, so it still counts through the entire range. I'm gonna turn that down a little bit more. So we'll just have it like that for now. Yeah, so and then this reset just, you know, resets. Not particularly useful, but whatever. Um, now if we go to the, ra the ROM, the ROM actually doesn't have any zeros. So it, even when the looping is enabled, it still loops through the entire contents of the ra uh, ROM. I can turn that up a bit. Whoops, went back to them. Okay, so that's kind of what you can do with the internal clock. Now, in my opinion, the most fun to have with this is when you program something into RAM and then you control it with some kind of external device. So what we're going to do now is I'm just going to program quickly a little thing into RAM. Very simple step kind of waveform. So I'll do that right away. Now this uh, K... So I'll do that right away. Okay, so here's how it is programmed. First of all, it's put into program enable mode with... Oh, come on. Program enable mode with the RAM selected. Now what I'm going to enter right now, I'm going to use this beautiful Q-tip sort of, to uh, flick the data switches because they're kind of sunk into the 
stupid thing. Um, but anyway, what I'm going to do, so right now we have one. Here, let's see, how well is this showing up? Oh, it's decent. Okay. So we have, uh, in address 0, we have 1 on the data bus. So now, on address 1, we're going to put 5. Okay, that's not 5, that's 10. Excuse me. What am I doing? That's 5. 0, 1, 0, 1. Okay. And address 2, we're going to put 10. Okay, and address 3, we're going to put 15. Now, of course, I'm just doing the right thing. <laughs> right thing, right thing, right there. Um, just to put each of these into memory. And then in address 4, we're going to put 0 so that it loops. So there you go. Address 4, we have 0. And now we put it back, these switches back to zero so that it, it, uh, it will start at zero. And then we uh, disable programming mode. And let's see. Oh, jeez, that's loud. But you can see that now on the oscilloscope we have a nice kind of stepped wave. Yep. Now I'm going to hook it up going to change the clock input and what we're going to do is we're going to hook it up to one of the keyboards over here this one in fact the Kawai KMA 37 okay so we have it hooked up now what I have this doing right now is I just have it Flute voice going out to the thing. So, pretty, pretty simple. Now, if you put vibrato on, of course, it works. put other voices on. It sounds pretty much the same. Slightly different. But the most interesting thing is when you play more than one key at the same time. So for example, if I pray I play a perfect fourth. that does affect it is the output volume. The volume going into the into the unit there. Now you may also be wondering, 
what happens if you play something that is not very pitched. So this thing has some basic uh, rhythm feature. So, and that's pretty much just using um, noise, like white, essentially white noise. <coughs> So yeah, it sounds pretty noisy. Now of course this, this synthesizer, I didn't design it with any kind of envelope generation uh, or any kind of amplitude control other than an output level potentiometer, which will be on the final product. So that kind of thing would have to be done with a separate unit. Of course it probably could easily, it definitely could easily. Um, Oh yeah, so that sounds pretty straightforward. Now, notice that I only played a perfect fourth and a perfect fifth. Some other intervals can be very interesting. Semitone. Major second. Minor third. Major third. Tritone. Whatever this is. Semitone up. Here's a chromatic scale going from the root. And actually the funny thing is, if you play more than one of the same note in different octaves, you can actually bring it kind of to a lower octave. That's kind of kind of cool. Oh yeah, here's what it actually sounds like without the uh, that thing. Oh. Come on. That's the flute voice. Voice. And this is the rhythm pattern that I was playing. And there's that. Now what happens if we put it to something a little more complex in its sound? Like the Willitzer 206 electric piano. I actually don't know. I haven't tried this yet. more than others. Oh yeah, I turned the vibrato off just there. Now one of the most interesting uses for it that I found so far. And of course I've only been messing with it for like a week or so. Is this modular synth. With this you can do quite interesting things and I'm just gonna go turn up the amp so you can hear what's going on. Okay. So
That's just adding resonance. That is just messing around and that's also just with one programmed waveform which was a very simple waveform so this thing has a lot of stuff that uh, is yet to be probably even discovered that it can sound like um, and basically I'm looking forward to making a finished product. Now I have the bottom piece here already. 
this is essentially done, is, although I haven't put any kind of circuit board mounting yet because I don't know what size the board is going to be. In any case, it's, uh, you can see it's got this hammer tone finish, which is not extremely even, but I like it, nonetheless. Um, some rubber feet on the bottom. The top piece is currently in the garage drying because I put primer on it and it's almost ready to paint the rest of it and here is a bunch of components there's still some that I'm waiting for to arrive in the mail and this, these are for mounting the circuit board probably fuse holder and okay one more thing to note that waveform that I was showing right here this is at the op amp output this is in inverted from what I entered. If you recall, I went 0, 5, 10, 15. Or excuse me, I didn't go 0 because if I did then it would just not play anything because it would try to loop. It went 1, 5, 10, 15. But as you can see, the highest here is I mean, you'd, you'd, you'd want it to be 0, 5, 10, 15, as in flip vertically. And I'll show you that actually that's what you're getting at the, the DAC output. See, here's the output from the DAC itself before the op amp. And if we do that, then that's precisely what we get. Uh, so 1, 5, 10, 15. Uh, and of course, yeah, the, I mean the way I have it set up on the op amp is simply to, uh, to have it invert the incoming signal. And I mean, does it really matter? No, it doesn't really matter in terms of what you actually hear. I mean, uh, a sawtooth wave sounds the same as a so-called ramp wave or inverted sawtooth um, so it's not super important but I may I mean that's one thing I may consider changing for the final version but uh, probably not <laughs> I probably won't um, because again doesn't really matter. Oh yeah, so it's running off this 9 volt supply. It's coming in here. This uh, regulator regulates it to 5 volts for most of the chips, because that's what TTL chips require. Uh, some of the circuits here are running on 9 volts, like this uh, off amp and this uh, frequency doubler circuit. And uh, yeah, so so basically, once once I have it all put together, I'm already working on what will essentially be like a service manual for it. I finished the schematics, and I finished a rough block diagram, and I'm going to put all of the necessary information for building this circuit on... Uh, on the website and uh, so anyone who wants to build this can uh, so I'll, I'll do that at some point and that should be about it so until next time